to you. There are um, the problem with unexpressed dependencies, which build tools largely solved, but also uh, shadowing the version conflicts uh, that Peter talked about in his keynote. Um, and then there are other downsides, which are not that immediately obvious, but it's a slow process because the JVM has to look into every package every time it loads a, sorry, jar every time it loads a class. Um, it's bad for maintenance if you can't really hide your internals. And again, we've seen that before um, earlier today. So we can skip that as well. Enter Project Jigsaw. You might think Enter OSGI, and that has, that's been uh, the right answer for this for like 20 years almost. And maybe Jigsaw can answer also a couple of these questions now. And my in official um, slogan for Jigsaw is that we want to teach the JVM about that graph that we have in our mind. History of Jigsaw, we could talk an hour about this, or because it's a 30-minute version, we could not about talk about it at all. The most important part is this. So let's hope Java 9 really gets released in July. Um, and if it does, it will come with Jigsaw and whatever I will tell you uh, for the next 25 minutes. This means all what I tell you is based on early access and could change. It didn't, this part did not change for the last year, and I think it's unlikely that it will in the future, but you know, don't trust anything I say. Um, also, it's the time to give community feedback, and I think the OSGI community already has a voice in the process, but maybe it could be stronger, who knows. So let's have a look at the goals of Project Jigsaw. The first one, reliable configuration, is if I have a set of jars, does, it, does this configuration make sense? Can I launch this configuration without jars missing and the program crashing at runtime with no class I found error? And then the second, story encapsulation, which Peter um, talked about, not under this words, but talked about earlier at Extend, where he said that um, for a module to work, it has to hide internals. It has to encapsulate internals which were not possible up to now. And there are a couple of other advantages. The scalable system would be nice if you, you know, if you have a backend, it would be great if you could have a JRE for your backend that does not contain Swing, for example. And um, more improvements when you can hide internal security uh, um, relevant code can be hidden. The performance can be better if the JVM knows where to look for classes. And um, Maintainability as well, if you hide internals, you're developing a library and you can hide it in stern, its internals, you have there's less of a chance, ideally no chance, that your users come to depend on it. That being said, non-goals of Jigsaw are version selection, meaning we have a bunch of versions of a single module lying around, which combination of version is the right one? That was never a goal of Jigsaw. But multiple versions once was a goal. And it was kicked out because of, uh, of time problems so to, make, to get this release out at all in 2017. So when you're using OSGI to solve the problem of I have dependencies or multiple versions of the same uh, library, then Jigsaw is not going to help you here, unfortunately. So how does Jigsaw plan to do all this? Again, the things I said in the beginning, we want to have a name, we want to have dependencies, clearly defined dependencies, and we want to encapsulate internals. And everything else follows from here. How exactly? There are a bunch of features, and this is not even complete. A lot of things got added over the last couple of months, um, but we're not going to look at all of that, of course. So we we'll try to focus on these things, and I cannot guarantee that we'll be looking at this. Depends on timing. Um, we'll start with the basics and see how, how far we get. Okay, so let's do just that. Let's just start with Java Model System basics, how to get started. In our graph, 
that we had in our mind earlier, we have the jars as nodes. And now jars turn to modules. So let's talk about modules. I already mentioned these three things a couple of times. Let's go into more detail now. Um, a jar, sorry, a module is supposed to have a unique name, like globally unique. Much like packages do, it makes sense to get, the, get an URL and just um, use the inverse URL naming scheme there. Then they would express their dependencies by naming which other modules they require. And by default, and that's interesting decision, by default, everything inside a module will be hidden except that the packages that I explicitly explore, uh, sorry, um, um, export. Again, if you're using OSGI, all of this must seem very familiar to you. But how does Jigsaw implement it? OSGI uses the manifest MF, and uh, the Jigsaw team decided to go a different route. In the a modular jar, it's just like a jar, like a regular jar, with a module info class in there. That goes so far that you can actually compile all your code to, to Java 8, then compile the module info class with Java 9, put it into the same jar, and have the code run on Java 8. So this thing get in, gets ignored by Java 8, but it's Java 9 will see it. And uh, this is the module descriptor which will tell uh, the jigsaw, the, the module system, how exactly to process your module. And where does it come from? It comes from the module info Java, which is a regular, well, almost regular source file. Um, it contains a couple of new keywords. And don't worry, these keywords are just keywords within the scope. So if you have a module, uh, sorry, if you have a variable called module, nothing will break. There's plenty of other ways you can break your code with Jigsaw, uh, but not this way. So you will write a module info Java, and you will say module, my module name requires the other module name, and so forth and so forth, more requires, and then a couple of exports where you list the package names. The more advanced features of Jigsaw also show up here. They will have different syntax, like there's um, export to and some other things, um, but all the information about the module will be found in the module info Java, the compiler will convert it to module info class. Now we have to talk about two concepts. The first one being readability. If we have our nodes, then we want to have edges between that. And readability puts in those edges. This is the term you will find in the documentation, so it makes, it makes sense to memorize it. Actually, it's pretty easy. If A requires B, then we say A requires B, or A depends on B. And this is more like a static thing, like something we would look at the source code and say, um, Spring requires Apache Commons. Then at runtime, the module system will see this declaration and will turn it into a reads edge, into a readability property, where it says that A can then read B and B is readable by A. I said earlier that we want one of the goals is reliable configuration, and readability is the basis for that. Reliable configuration means that Java will only compile or launch, both compiler and JDK, uh, compiler and um, JVM enforce these rules, will only do their job when every dependency is fulfilled, when there are no cycles, and a couple of other ambiguities that can crop up when all none of them is there. So with this, you have a high chance to catch many of the errors that used to crash a program very early. While launching, the JVM can tell you, you depend on the Guava module, it's not here. Or you depend on the Guava module, and it's here in two versions. That kind of stuff. So um, this should catch many of these uh, errors early. The second concept is accessibility. So accessibility here is here to hide internals. It's the basis for strong encapsulation, the other major goal of Project Jigsaw. And it builds directly on top of readability. So if you're used to how OSGI does hiding and accessibility rules, note that this is different. We'll later see a little bit how exactly this is different. But note that readability and accessibility are concepts that are new for the whole platform. So accessibility is defined as follows. Um, a type in one module is only accessible to code in another module if the type is public and the module that owns the, the type exports that package and the other module can read that module. All of these three things have to be fulfilled. So this means that public is no longer really public, right? Because before it was, when a type is public, everybody can see it. Now there are two additional rules. The package has to be exported, which kind of makes sense if you want to hide internals. But the other one is also interesting. Uh, types are only accessible if the module who wants to access that type reads the containing module. That means that today you can, if you don't use a different module system, you can accidentally depend on your dependencies' dependencies. 
again, let's say I use Spring and Spring uses Apache Commons, then I can start using Apache Commons code. My IDE will helpfully provide me with all the imports. At runtime, Apache Commons is always there because you know Spring depends on it. But I never express that this dependency anywhere. Like my POM XML, for example, or if I use Gradle, uh, my Gradle build info file will not show this dependency. So when um, at some point Spring uh, drops that dependency, my code will suddenly stop working. So that's not something I don't, I don't really want. The interesting part about this is not only that public is no longer public, it also means that reflection doesn't work to get around that. Uh, we'll see later, if we get time to that, how that um, caused some uh, interesting discussions, but we'll see it shortly um, as well. The important part here is there are escape hatches for this. For all of the rules that I tell you about, where um, the module system forbids this or that, there are command line escape hatches that you can use when you run your system to get out of this. Um, I think it's, not I think, definitely it's on purpose that it's on the command line, so it's, it's not that easily done, that not the author of the code, but the consumer of the code has to make this decision. Also, I think there's a little bit of shaming involved. So if you have to call a customer and tell them, look, I know you have a long batch script to launch this, now you have to add these 20 add exports, um, you know, that should feel bad. So you can use these command line escape hatches, but you should, of course, try to avoid them. So some of the consequences from my point of view is that definitely there's a great boost for maintainability. Finally, as a library developer, can, you can really hide internals and you can make sure that your um, clients do not depend on this. As well as you have a, if you're um, leading a big project, and maybe it's, this happened to you, that your developers accidentally started depending on implementation details, and at some point you realize if you want to um, update, for example, that dependency, you're screwed because all of these internals were changed. So this cannot happen um, when you're maintaining a big project, a applic big application either. That's good. But this is also a big reason for the community unrest you might have heard about. So uh, the initial idea was, at least as far as, well, I think the official opinion is different, but as far as I got it, the, official, the initial idea was that classes that start with, any package that starts with sun, which is an internal package, was supposed to be unaccessible. So there are a couple of things in there that everybody uses. Apparently base64 encoder and decoder are among them, but there are good alternatives for that. But then next on the list is sun misc unsafe, and there are, for many things in there, there are no alternatives. So when it turned out that maybe this class would be gone, um, the community reacted very strongly um, and wanted it, this to change. And it is likely that this will be changed, so in the end, sun misc unsafe will be available at least for another major Java release. In general, life will get tougher for reflection-based libraries and frameworks. And no matter how this whole thing plays out, if you use it or if you write one um, such a library or framework, then you will have to do a little bit more work than earlier. Okay, let's start with a very simple example. And because you've been modularizing applications for a long time now, let's try to be quick about it. So this is an advent calendar. A calendar has 24 calendar sheets. Each sheet has a surprise. This is an interface. I have a surprise factory interface that you know creates surprises. And I have two uh, simple factory implementations here. And the main method just binds all of this together. It creates a list of the two factories, which I had to cut short. Um, dumps it into a list, turns the calendar, gives the calendar the list, and says, look, create yourself. And then the calendar can turn itself into text and be printed. So this is really very simple. Let's now look at what we can do if we move to Java 9. The first and most important realization is we don't have to create modules. Like the application I just showed you, whether it's one jar or several jars, um, we don't have to do anything. We can just put the jar on the class path and everything will continue to work as long as we didn't do anything forbidden. So that's, that's good to know. Also, it's pretty boring. So let's look at a slightly different approach where we say we make a single module where all our application code lives in, in the same module. We now know that this means, at least for now, that it has to be one jar. So if we have one jar and one module, we need one module descriptor. And this is how that would look. First of all, I cut the name short again here, but it's eerily empty. So it exports no API if we start in the bottom. That makes sense. Nobody's calling into our application. It also requires no other modules, which is strange, because shouldn't it rely on the module which, which it uses within Java? It, it uses some Java code. It doesn't have to um, require that. And the answer is, in general, yes. If you use Swing, you have, to rely, you have to require Java Desktop, or for XML, Java XML, or Java SQL. All these modules are like 80 of them. 
but there's one special module, and that's Java Base. Java Base contains a lot of stuff, but particularly it contains object. And since you can't really write Java code without using object, everybody would have to depend on Java Base. So instead of making everybody put this requires Java Base in there, you get this dependency for free. It also contains lists and stuff, so you can actually write some low-level um, programs with, with just with Java Base. This is still pretty boring, but we can see readability and accessibility at work here. Um, Advent requires Java Base, which means that at runtime, the JVM will create readability edge here, where Advent can read Java Base. And because Java Base exports a couple of packages, the public types in these packages will become accessible to Advent. So you can see the two-step process, readability and accessibility at work here. This is actually it intuitively makes sense, but it's still worth to um, go through the step a couple of times mentally to see how this plays out. Okay, now let's go into create multiple modules. There are different ways to cut it. I decided to have one module for the calendar, one for the surprise API here, one for the factories, and another one for the whole main method. Again, I think we don't have to spend too much time on this. The dependency should be quite clear. Calendar needed the surprise factory, sorry, needed um, uh, calendar sheet dependent on the surprises, and these implement the surprise factory, so just trust me, these dependencies make sense. Let's look at a couple of module descriptors, which also um, are quite straightforward. The module surprise over here has no dependencies, so it requires nothing, but it exports the package where the surprises are in. Then calendar factories are pretty simple as well. They do require a surprise, and they export the package that contains that stuff. You see the difference between calendar and factories is really small. And then advent is a little bit different again. It exports nothing because nobody uses it, nobody calls into it, and it depends on all three of these other modules. So that's nice. Now, don't be shocked. Maybe you don't write command line Java very often. I sure don't. Uh, let's not go over all this in detail. The important part is this here. We have a folder mods where I already compiled a couple of modules in. So when I want to compile this module now, I tell the compiler with the minus p, minus p, which means module path, that there is this directory. So when it compiles all of these classes in case, case it needs any modules, please look in here. It's much like the class path, but for modules. Then jar is like before, but I can already specify the main class here, which is nice. And when I launch the application, I do the same thing. I tell it, this is the mods folder. You will find any modules in there. And then please start the module advent. So it looks into the mods folder, searches for a module that says I'm advent, checks whether all the dependencies and transitive dependencies are there. If so, it realizes that advent has actually a main class, so it can start the main method in advent, and there you go. Okay, these were the basics. Now, usually, there's, there's a lot of lanes to explore from here. We could look into advanced, um, into advanced uh, features, like, for example, there's a service API. Whoever knows the service loader from Java 6, the module system will, will um, work together with that, so it can have kind of services. Um, there are a lot of other small details that are worth looking at, but I think uh, right now two topics make sense. Let's have a look to, at OSGI, especially at this conference, and then what exactly happens when I actually start to migrate to Java 9? And let's see how far we get here. I'm not an expert on OSGI, so this is really a high-level overview. Um, but if you followed this far, I think you're sure you, you've seen a lot of parallels. OSGI bundles are very similar to modules in a lot of fundamental ways. Both are just jars with some kind of descriptor. Both have names. Both can import stuff. While Java can only, sorry, while Jigsaw can only import entire modules, OSGI can import packages as well, which is, I heard, the preferred way to do it. You can also import um, entire bundles, though. And both define public APIs by exporting packages. So this far, they're very similar, and I would say that for low-level modularization problems, they cover like 60, 80% of the cases. But you know that OSGI does more, right? Um, First of all, Jigsaw has no concept of versions. You can tell, when you create a module, you can tell the jar command that this is version 2.0 or whatever, but Java never, at least at the moment, never looks at that and never evaluates that information. It's purely for, um, to be used at reflection, with reflection at runtime or um, to, with other tools. The Java module system has no idea of versions, while OSGI, of course, does. 
Jigsaw is very static. It's meant to be what I just showed you, like the one module graph and one set of modules. It's meant to exist at launch time. There's the concept of layers in which you can have new module graphs in there. You can load an entire new module configuration, a new layer. That is something that, um, that application containers will surely do. But still, it's not really a dynamic system like OSGI, where you can have individual bundles appear and disappear and have um, even not get notifications about that. Then services, both have services, and both support declarative services, but OSGI is more flexible, allowing programmatic um, service declaration as well. Um, the service loader in um, Jigsaw is a good, good start, but I think it's not there yet. The most important part is the one below, the class loaders. Jigsaw operates below class loaders. That was an important decision, at least as far as I understood it, why OSGI was not even really considered to, to be implemented within the JDK. Because there are lots of systems out there that use class loaders for things. If, OSGI, sorry, if Jigsaw were to enforce a certain class loader hierarchy, then chances are very high that a lot of code will break. And in a way that is very unpredictable, in a way that is not obvious why that should happen. People have been using public APIs and now the code suddenly breaks. That shouldn't be the case. So class loaders, um, so, so Jigsaw operates below class loaders. While, as you know, I guess, OSGI uses the one class loader per bundle mechanism because there was not really any other way to enforce something like accessibility. When you want to think like, well, how do Jigsaw and OSGI work together? Neil Bartlett is over there, I think, and he has written a couple of interesting blog posts about that. I recommend them. But uh, as far as I get it, um, there will be collaboration. Uh, sorry, there will be, there will be, um, um, damn it. They will work together well um, for those basic use cases. But that might, again, that, that's it's an interesting co topic that's still under discussion. So I got seven minutes left and two topics to cover. One of them, so this, by the way, until here, that was the part that I wanted to get through with. Now we're in the bonus section. There are two bonus sections. One is, how do I migrate into this? And the other one is, why can, every, why can my code break? Um, and I would like, let you choose which one you want to explore. So let's say, hands up for migration, he wants to know how to move into Jigsaw. OK, he wants to know about compatibility. More people, let's do that then. OK. Um, Cool. So good news, uh, your code can break even though you don't do any modularization. I said earlier, you can just take your code, put it on the class path, and it just works. Well, that's true, unless you do stuff you shouldn't be doing, uh, in which case it breaks regardless of whether you modularize your own code. There are a couple of things that go wrong, and I want to try to, um, to hurry through them. The first and obvious thing is internal APIs. Um, all that is in Sunstar, all the, most that is in ComSunstar is an internal API. And the slide said half a year earlier, all of that will be gone. Now it looks like not all of that will be gone. We saw that some things will survive. And they will do so in a module which will be called JDK Unsupported. So you know that you're really relying on support stuff now. There are a couple of deprecated methods um, which were actually removed, which is kind of a first in Java, like deprecated stuff getting removed. That's new. Um, but hardly anybody ever use it, used them. So what to look for? You can use JDEPS, which is a command line tool that comes with Java 8. Um, but you should use the most current version of Java 9 to use it, because details change. And JDEPS does a lot of stuff. You can run it um, to analyze package dependencies and um, other interesting things on your code base. But it has this JDK internals flag, which is awesome to um, have it yell at you if you depend on internal API. So you run that over your code, and you see where you do things that you shouldn't be. And there's an Apache plugin. I wrote this one, which is better, but I don't have time to explain why. Um, so I would recommend make this part of your build once you, once you analyze these cases, um, prevent relapses. This only finds static dependencies. If you use reflection with class for name or something, or especially the set accessible calls, which are a giant red flag when it comes to this, then this will not be detected. You have to grab for these yourself. And this is the fun part. Do this for all your dependencies. Because if your code doesn't break, but your framework you rely on breaks, well, I think your boss doesn't care and your customers don't either. What should you do if you find something? Contact library developers and tell them about it. Maybe they already know, so plus one the issue and tell them it's urgent. Um, look for alternatives in your depend in your, um, within the JDK or within other libraries. And if nothing else works, you can use this flag 
to, which is wrong, the X is gone by now, update, have to update the slide, should be minus minus add exports now. You can use this flag to tell a, to tell a module to um, export additional packages. Everything else doesn't help and you think it's so unfair, why me, you can turn to the mailing list. Split packages. Um, that was a surprise, I didn't know that was a thing. But, um, packages should have a unique origin within the module system, which means there should be no two modules which export the same kind of packages. But the actual implementation is pretty strict. It says um, as soon as two modules even contain the same package, Jigsaw will, JVM will refuse to launch. And the interaction with the class pass is especially funny, but we, let's not go into that. I wondered who would do that. Why would, two, why would two different jars contain classes in the same package? But it happens occasionally. So there are the XML APIs, which comes from Circes. JBoss modules do that. Um, the JSR 305 jar. I just recently learned that if you want to look for this, you can actually use the, what's it called, Maven Enforcer plugin. And there is um, a rule ban duplicate classes rule or something like that, which apparently you can use to detect this. I have to update the slide. This, I found this out a couple of days ago. Um, with this, you can actually find these things automatically. If you do, what do you next? Um, you find out whether the split is on purpose. I think in many cases it might not be. Um, you should find other ways to solve the problem. And then there's the concept of upgradable modules, which you can use to replace entire models with your own, with your own code. Or you can use patch to push individual classes into an existing module. Okay, let's jump over the more arcane things that can go wrong. Um, yeah, take a look at JEP261. It contains a list of things. So my general advice is look for these two things because they're the most relevant ones, ones most likely. Then get your, short in get your code in shape and make sure that there are no relapses. Try to integrate this into a build somehow. Very important, check your dependencies and tools, and if any of them are suspicious, work on replacing them or updating them. In general, the most important part is get everything you depend on up to date now, because if Guava 14 breaks and Guava 20 doesn't, sorry, Guava 21 doesn't anymore, then if you're stuck with 14, that's not really of good use to you. So try to find, um, try to get them up to date now. Whew, good. So I said I have, if I have time left, I want to uh, talk about myself. Uh, I'm Nicola, you can find me here on um, Google Plus if you have to. I prefer Twitter though. Um, I blog here and I'm the editor of sideport.com slash Java. And if you want to learn more about this, you can reach out to me or you can um, register for a course we're doing in Zurich. And um, you can also buy this book when it's out, which is not yet the case. Thank you. <laughs>